everyone. Uh, this is Chip Branscom with Pinnacle InfoTech, and I want to welcome you to day two of our nine day webinar series, Disrupt or Be Eliminated. My name is Chip Branscom, and I'm the Director of Engineering here at Pinnacle InfoTech. As a licensed professional engineer, I've been working in the AEC industry for 34 years, and personally watched, participated, and at times been dragged into the next phase of technology. Pinnacle is the leading global BIM services provider to the AEC industry. While working on many iconic projects around the world, we've participated in and witnessed firsthand the profound changes in technology over the last three decades. Our dream is to share our knowledge with others in the construction industry. We've partnered with other leading edge organizations, and I want to thank our special partner, Steve Jones, with us today with Dodge Data and Analytics for support for this webinar. Many of you have already registered for all nine webinars and we hope you benefit from these educational sessions and we encourage you to continue to engage and improve our processes in the construction industry. Today's session will be an hour long where we'll take you through our presentation and in the last 15 minutes or so, we'll address any questions you may have. So please submit questions during our presentation for consideration. We're also recording this webinar and will be uh, provided to participants afterwards. Your active participation is important throughout the session. Right now, everyone is muted to avoid background noises that may be a distraction. You can enter your questions and comments in the question box throughout the presentation. If you'd rather ask in person, you can click the hand icon on the control panel to raise your hand to indicate that you have a question or comment. Once you raise your hand, our moderator will be able to unmute your line so you can speak. So let's get started. Our topic today is integrated MEP design and construction. We're going to hear from Steve with Dodge Analytics and gain insight into the connection between design and construction and how software, BIM, and process improvements can result in better, faster, and improved building systems. I'll be presenting later so that in turn, uh, I'll turn it over to Steve. Uh, here we go, Steve and myself. Um, I'll turn it over to Steve uh, to get started. So Steve, if you want to take control and have at it. Great, thanks, Chip. I, I like that you admit that at some point you've been dragged into the future of, of technology. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Jones. I was uh, in architecture and engineering for about 20 years, principal of a big firm. And uh, I made the dot-com jump at the end of last century and, and went with Primavera, which was amazing for me because that really engaged me with some of the biggest projects happening anywhere in the world because they're all using Primavera. It was, it was a fantastic experience for me to really get engaged with the global construction industry. Now for the last uh, 16 or 17 years, I've been with uh, Dodge, and that's uh, initially it was part of McGraw-Hill, and now we're a private company, but uh, I've been doing our research and have been putting out uh, what are known as smart market reports on BIM and other topics now uh, for that period of time. So we're gonna talk today about a specific project that we recently worked on. We've been doing research about BIM specifically for about 14 years. And those early years, hey, Chip, you have to give me control. Uh, I think you've got it. Try it. Okay. I'm clicking, but it's not advanced. Okay, well, let me advance it, I guess. There you go. I get it. I'll, I'll try it that way. Key objectives for today. Uh, hopefully, you're going to get some understanding from a global perspective about what this integrated design and construction movement's about. Uh, collaborating using the central model, integrating using different analysis softwares, and then some case studies. And that's really going to be what Chip's going to focus on more than anything else. Okay, uh, sorry, give me a second here. There we go. Oh, go back up one. So as I say, we've been doing research reports on BIM for about 14 years now. In those early days, it was really about tracking which companies have adopted that software and are producing models themselves, right? What became increasingly clear as we studied the value of BIM and where people are getting the value from it is that it had more to do than anything else with how many other people on the project team are also engaged in BIM. 
right? It's really the power of that integrated multi-party digital workflow, or what you can simply call connected BIM, as opposed to simply BIM by itself, right? The value of somebody owning the software and doing things themselves in a silo was creating what we were calling silos of excellence. And that wasn't really helping move the needle and make the industry stronger. <clears throat> so we did a study of architects, structural engineers, MEP engineers, GCs, structural trades, and MEP trades, you back up one, um, just to baseline where we are in practice. And we were <clears throat> focused specifically on integrated digital workflows for structure and MEP. The first we wanted to just start with, are you guys getting value from your engagement with BIM? And as you will see throughout a number of these slides, we differentiate here between the top line and the lower line, that dark blue line and the light blue line. The top blue line, I use a swimming pool a lot as an analogy for BIM use, right? Are you in the deep end of the pool? Are you doing more than half your work with BIM? Are you really pretty committed? Are you a heavy user? Or are you still in the shallow end of the pool, right? You're more of a dabbler. Less than half your projects are really involved with BIM. And you will see here the difference between the level of, of value that people are getting. Uh, is it improving your collaboration? Is it helping you to eliminate unnecessary rework? Is it helping reduce your costs and material waste? Uh, those three came out very strong. And then the more BIM you're doing, the more you feel like you're getting those benefits, right? Very, very supportive of the greater use of BIM. Uh, the two below that, the cloud-based technology is clearly a newer aspect of making teams work more effectively together and then engaging the supply chain earlier, which is something we think is really gonna be sort of the next wave of BIM, is getting manufacturers and suppliers and really that whole ecosystem involved with the modeling with digital, integrated digital workflows, uh, right? Early yet, not that many people are seeing that they're uh, getting those benefits, but these are the kinds of things that we like to track over time because I'm pretty sure we're gonna see some pretty big lift in that in the future. Okay, so the next slide. So when you take that top values and you break it down by discipline, since we had all these disciplines engaged, and you see that line 67, now you begin to see it ain't the same for everybody, right? We're not all experiencing this at the same degree of engagement and benefit. And the MEP engineers and the architects, right, furthest upstream, important, right? If, if they're modeling, then it makes it better for everybody else to model, right? You really begin that digital workflow. Well, they're lagging a bit, right? Uh, but you'll see the GC is very strong. Uh, the structural engineer is the strongest of the three, right? But you really see the trades uh, and the GCs leading more so uh, than the design professionals. The next slide. So we wanted to know what some of the obstacles are. You know, what, what sorts of you know, percentage of each discipline is at rate the shortage of labor? Is it the fact that you just don't have people with BIM skills? Is that what's holding you back? Uh, see right there, that's where the MEP engineers stick their hand up and go, that's our problem, man, you nailed it. All right, so that's addressable. All right, this is an addressable problem by the industry. All right, we can help MEP engineers bring more trained uh, BIM users and people who understand the digital workflow into their organizations, but that's clearly where their, where their problem was. And you saw that to some degree with the structural trades and MEP trades. And we said, well, are they technology related issues, right? And we went we're for three here. Is it the high cost of software? Is it the fact that software really doesn't interoperate very well, the various tools that you have? Or is it the fact that, yeah, you know, you gotta upgrade your hardware to make these tools run better? And here again, you know, um, there's a lot of variety between the different players. Uh, the point is here, we're all advancing at different rates and have different challenges and have different benefits. So it's a very nuanced picture, right? As this industry changes from being an analog workflow-based industry to being a digital workflow-based industry. So you you have the opportunity to download this report. Uh, so please take a look at it because you know, spend a little time with some of these charts because there's a lot of text and, and, and all that go with it. Next slide, please. So what we wanted to find out was as a practicing architect, in this case, how do you perceive the amount of BIM-ready engineering firms that are in the marketplaces that you work? 
can you find enough engineers that you can bring on a team and they bring BIM skills with them? And again, you see a lot of variety here, right? The dark blue is, yeah, we got plenty of people. No sweat, we're in great shape. The middle blue, eh, we got some. The light blue is, we ain't got nobody. We're hurting. Okay, and you can see, we track civil in this as well, just to make sure that we're, we're paying attention to that because they're lagging a bit, but it's really important. We also get the civils involved in this, but we wanted to actually get some data for it. And as you'll see, only 15% said they even have anybody in their marketplace who can come to the table ready to play. Um, structural is in the best shape of all, right? Three quarters are saying, I have no problem finding really good BIM skilled structural engineers. That's not a problem. Mechanical is after that, but it begins to fall a little bit with, with plumbing and electrical. But again, these are things we love to track this stuff over the years so we can now begin to show how the industry is getting better. This is where we were uh, when we took this snapshot. Next. So then we ask those engineers, okay, are you doing anything about that? Do you have policies in place that do actually require or at least encourage BIM, right? So the light blue is, we got no policy whatsoever. The middle is, well, we encourage it, but we don't require it. That dark blue is, we require it. And then again, we've divided here between those folks who are in the deep end of the BIM pool and those folks who are in the shallow end, right? So the, at, at upper right, at 51%, you know, that's how many architects who are in the deep end of the BIM pool absolutely mandate. You can't work for me unless you come ready to play BIM, okay? And then dropping down to structural, in the middle there, 53% of them, right? So over half are saying, I will not play with somebody. I won't let somebody on a project team unless they come ready to play BIM, right? That's what you like to see. That's because that's in their control, right? You can complain about all sorts of other stuff. Oh, the software's expensive. Oh, I can't get people trained. Oh, the hey man, this is in your control, right? So that's why we wanted to spend some time figuring out where we stand with that. Who's doing what that's actually in their control to do something about, right? Um, not so much for civils, but again, you know, these are things that are worth tracking because this is all gonna just get better and better as we go forward. Next slide, please. Hang on, sorry. So we did the same thing with, with GCs. We said, all right, in the markets that you're operating, when you want to bring on a trade, all right, do you have trades that come ready to play BIM? Um, and the mechanicals, that was the strongest. You know, almost two thirds of them are saying, yep, I got no problem, I'm in good shape. Uh, drops off again, plumbing and electrical. And it did surprisingly with structural too. Really only half of them said, yeah, I've got somebody, I've got people all the time who are really good. Uh, falls way off though with, when you get down into the precast and the casting place. That's an area again that you know we like to find these places that we can point to to say, hey, industry, come on, let's see if we can't help our brothers and sisters in the precast and the casting place to actually get better at using models because it's just going to help everybody. Next slide. And similarly, look, the thing that you can control is you can put policy in place that says you have to come ready to play BIM or you can't be on my team. I'm not gonna all accept your bid, right? And so uh, the top two lines there are mechanical and the middle of plumbing and the bottom of electrical. And you can see those folks in the deep end of the pool, 91%, 82%, 82% are insisting you cannot be on my project unless you're going to come ready to play BIM, right? That's a mandate, it's an absolute requirement. The middle blue is, you know, we'll, we'll allow you to do it, uh, or we encourage it. And then you see the same thing here with structural, right, in terms of how many people are demanding it, how many people are encouraging it but not demanding it, and then how many people have no policy whatsoever. And hopefully, you know, the dark blue is going to keep getting bigger, the light blue is going to keep getting smaller as we, as we revisit this in the future. Okay. So when we took the, the, the future view, uh, we asked them, and this is broken out by discipline, which of these 
six things do you think are going to be really high or very high positive impact? And so you'll see the percentages here, you know, they were given an oppor opportunity to say this will have no impact, low, medium, high, or very high. So we took the high and the very high, and this is the percentage that you see. And, you know, what's really powerful here is, you know, you, you're going to see what it is that people most care about, right? The things that excite them the most. No surprise, architecture, my background, uh, tools that allow visual and creative insight to produce better design alternatives at less time, oh, architect all over that, right? Um, and then, you, you know, you'll see as you go through for the structural, the MEPs, you know, which things are most important to who. And again, it's a really important insight into the drivers by discipline of where people want functionality to go so that they can be more productive, more effective by the use of these digital tools. Uh, again, please take some time studying this in the report. You'll have plenty of time to look over it. There's a lot of other information with it. Okay, next, please. So the point of doing this benefits question was specifically around you know what it says underneath the title there. When you have other key team members engaged, right? So this is sort of that power of having the team engage with them, not just one or two players, right? Where are you seeing the lift, right? And again, this is broken out by you know, deep end of the pool, the dark blue line, the lighter blue lines are those still in the shallow end of the pool, but. You know, everybody, all the, the heavy pin users jumped on this on-site coordination of materials and installation. Huge, great benefit, right? Followed by improved overall quality and performance of the final building, improved overall project schedule control and compliance, improved budget control and compliance. And then we um, do a safety report every two years. We're big believers in, in trying to help improve the safety in the industry. Um, and so we'll always put safety stuff into these BIM reports, just to, uh, BIM studies, just to find out where people are thinking, because we are committed to seeing that there's definitely going to be a, a, an increasingly strong connection between the use of BIM and uh, improved safety. So it's here, it's relatively low, you know, but it's going to grow. Next, please. So then we dug into the frequency of the inter integrated workflow. We gave a definition of the integrated workflow that involves all the parties. And so initially, initial design modeling, moving through detailing, moving through fabrication, right, moving out to installation, everybody's working off that model. That's how we define this thing called the integrated workflow. So we said, all right, how many of you are actually doing it, right, on, on how many of your projects? That dark blue, right, are folks who are doing it, either that full integrated workflow or most of it on at least half or more of their projects. That's what you want, right? That's our goal. Today, you know, the MVP trades were the strongest with that. Uh, a little over a third of them said, yeah, that's, that describes us. But as you can see, we got work to do, all right? Because we want that dark blue to be the majority out there. Uh, the next color was, yeah, I'm doing a lot of it, but it's on, on half on, or less of my projects. Interestingly, those are really small because it's like, if you're doing it, you're going to start doing it on everything. It's just so good, all right? Uh, but then you got, you know, that sort of lighter blue shades of, well, we're, we're dabbling with it uh, or we're not doing it at all. You know, we've got to drive those things, right? This is really important for the future of the industry. Next. Because we did ask those folks who are engaged with it and we said, where are you getting the benefits? And look at these numbers. This is incredible. This is really hard to do any other way. Right, you're getting better communications, you're getting better coordinated designs in less time, you're getting better coordinated shops, you're reducing duplicated tasks, you're getting more accurate estimates from trades, you're minimizing the impact of design changes, you're requiring fewer iterations during this whole design detailing and fabrication phase. These are really difficult benefits to do just by yelling at people more, right? <laughs> or writing tougher contracts. You really have to get at the process. So this integrated digital workflow is really producing these sorts of benefits. Next. And we took it into that installation and handover phase. Where you, what benefits are you getting there? Reducing errors in the field installation. Oh man, the hardest thing to fight, right? That's so tough, it's such a big problem. But look at that. People saying that it really cuts that tracking material status and doing as built and improving safety. Next. And then when you look at the finished product, project, you know, and look back at it, 
Uh, what can you say? Did you improve schedule performance, better quality, reducing material waste, improving your company's profitability, and reducing the costs, right? Really hard to achieve any other way than getting at this real fundamental change of how we do business as an industry and making it all about integrated, digital, multi-party workflows. Next. So again, please take, a, take some time, download the report, take a look at it. We break it out here by which one of the disciplines ranks which one of those benefits as one, two, three, and four. The one I love is where you look across the top, almost everybody's really saying that better communication. When you get to the MVP trades, God bless them. Oh, dude, I'm reducing errors in the field installation. That is tangible for me. That is money in my pocket. And right after that is improving my schedule performance. I love those because those are highly tangible, <laughs> repeatable and scalable and super valuable. That was, that was a great finding. I love that. Okay, next. We asked about the predicted future benefits, right? For those who are doing it, where do you think this is going to lead in the future? We, you know, you told us what your benefits you're getting now. What do you think is going to be, uh, you know, a few years out is really going to be ringing the bell for you? And after 20 years in, in, as an architect, I got to tell you, I love seeing the number one there. Where three quarters of all those folks said, you know, we're all going to be able to work together to better realize the design intent. I went, ah, oh, <laughs> hallelujah. That's just good for everybody. And then enabling teams to work collaboratively and distributed yeah, graphics and uh, owner confidence, attracting and training a tech savvy workforce, allowing firms to complete more with less labor and innovating the use of new materials. All interesting things that we're going to see grow because of this integrated workflow. Thanks. All right, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, this is Chip Branscombe again. Um, that's excellent. And I love how you're passionate about uh, seeing the uh, architects and especially the engineers get uh, excited about uh, reduced problems in the field and the risk management. Um, so here again, briefly my background, 34 years of experience in the construction industry. Uh, 14 of that is a design build contractor and the rest working as either a consulting engineer or as an architectural engineering consultant. So he also, as Steve mentioned, we have the handout that you can download, uh, gives you a little more information and some insight into some of the statistics he was just uh, showing us. So, so what are the challenges, traditional construction, right? He talked about the perfect silos, I think is how you described it, right? The design it, the bid it, the build it. Three separate tasks, three separate teams, right? Many have never collaborated before, right? Look at, look at this slide here. 92% information is not available when plans are made. Why is that, right? Um, wait a minute, I screwed something up. Um, the information is not there because you don't have the team assembled, right? You've got the architect, you've got the design program at the very, very early phases, right? So look at this process here. When do you engage the design team, right? Um, in my experience, architects and owners, they're gonna do as much programming because they wanna get the, the, the structure, the idea of what they're gonna build and how they're gonna do it. But then they have to engage the engineers, the structural engineer, the MEP. When do you engage them, right? How, how long do you hold them off before you get them involved? Perfect example on a design build project was a high-end condominium project I worked on. So these were ultimate condos. Architect and the developer had, had them sold, right? So you, let's say Steve bought one of these. Steve goes out, buys one of these condos, and then I come along as a design build engineer later during the process and say, hey, um, I need to lower the ceilings. And they're like, absolutely not, right? We've already sold this. Steve's putting that grandfather clock in the, in the living room there. We got to have a nine foot ceiling. And I said, well, that's fine. But your steel is three inches below the ceiling because they didn't know that. The architect, the structural engineer, we all worked in our silos, right? So we just didn't know what was going on there until construction began. So let's move it upstream, right? Let's get this team put together instead of these zigzag communications, right? Let's get it all put together so we're working together, right? As an integrated process, right? So it has everybody involved early on, oops, um, pardon that. Um, so has everybody involved early on, and then you've got a lot more talent, right? You've brought the structural, you've brought the electrical, you've brought the plumbing. We're all looking at it together instead of in those silos as we talked about, right? 
So what I think is interesting too is BIM, right? Building information modeling. It means so many different things to different people, right? I think it's the easily the most overused and misunderstood acronym in our business. 3D is not BIM. Colorful models, they're not BIM. A BIM model has intelligence imparted by the creator, whether that's the designer, the architect, or the engineer, right? I used to tell, and this is years ago, I'm showing my age, um, with the CAD software, AutoCAD, Autodesk, God bless them, right? CAD files, right? Circles, lines, squares, and text, right? That's what it is. And so guess what? When you do a beautiful Revit model, a 3D BIM model with intelligent information, but when you issue that as a 2D uh, document for bid, permit, construction, none of that intelligence is imparted, right? None of that goes with the, um, um, with the information to the field. So the challenge is, and, and I challenge everybody out there, how often has the architect and engineer, engineer especially, been hesitant to give you that model, right? To say, hey, wait a minute. Um, yeah, I don't want you to do that. You know, I'm not sure it's right. I'm not sure it's perfect. It's all about the risk avoidance, right? So I think that's the, the paradigm shift or the mentality to say, look, we're all in this together, right? Um, I had an old timer uh, when I first started working said, uh, hey, there's never enough time to do it right the first time, but there's always enough time to redo it. You know, and think about that. How many times have you had to drop what you're doing to go uh, solve a problem, uh, fix something in the field? Um, you know, it's just, it's just the interesting concept of how this is coming together, how we need to change the way it comes together. So this integrated workflow, right? Again, the concept to the model, how many drawings are created? How many models, right? The architect's gonna make one, engineers are gonna make one, you got a structural model, you got an MEP, maybe they're together, maybe they're separate. But then at the end of the day, you toss it out for construction and for bid, the contractors, the GCs, you know, you saw those charts that Steve had, they're gonna create their own model. And then I, I've learned firsthand, right, as an engineer on both sides of the fence, and, and I, I have to say I'm guilty of this, that the first Revit model that I did, I had to get it out the door, right? The deadline was pending, I had to get it out the door. So unfortunately, I had to fake some lines. I had to fake some elements in the 3D model, right? But it looked perfect going out as a 2D drawing. So the sad part was the model was not usable for construction, right? We really need to get it to the point where we're all sharing that same model and that we're all working together with that same intelligent information. And in today's day and age, looking at, you know, the world, the world's flat, right? Um, right now with our video conference here, the webinar, right? We're in uh, Philadelphia, we're in Cincinnati, we're in Denver, we're in India, we're all over the world. So we're sharing and that's, that's the strength, right? There's so many products out there that allow us to share in real time the model, right? We're working with architects and engineers that are up to date, changing information um, in, in real time. So we can share that information. We're not limited by data transfer anymore. Um, one of the uh, projects I once worked on, here, let me get to this next slide here. Um, so this is, to me, this is the perfect example. Let's try something, right? Um, this is an example here where, you know, there's a lighting layout, right? There's 20 fixtures per room. And look at this, you know, we could actually go with 16 based on the photometrics, right? So what, think about this process here. It's quite possible that an RFI could have been raised during construction, right? The electrical in contractor would have said, hey, Mr. Engineer, would it be possible to do this? We think it's gonna, it's gonna work. It'll save money on first cost, operating and maintenance costs, right? In the real world, this is how I've personally seen this play out. The electrical contractor sends an RFI to the general contractor. He sends it to the architect. Architect sends it to the engineer. And very honestly, their first response is suspicion. Why, why are they asking this? You know, can't they read the drawings? Did they miss something? Are they trying to make it up? Uh, you know, it, it looks like it might be okay, but this is gonna take hours for me to do the calculations to check it. I'm the engineer, you know, how do I know this contractor knows what he's doing, right? Or are they trying to make me look dumb in front of my architect, client, and the owner, right? I don't have time in my budget to drop what I'm doing. I'm working on other projects. I designed this one six months ago. So in reality, 
the easiest thing for the engineer to do is say, eh, leave it as it is, right? It's okay, it's just fine. So, but in the real world, if we would have collaborated on that process, think about it, we'd save fixtures, we'd save over the life of that facility. As far as the performance would be the same, energy would be saved. It's just a much better process if we have the people at the table earlier in the process. So this one here, talking about faster design process, right? Um, think about this, especially in the mechanical world with the uh, energy modeling software, the load calculations. Um, I think the slide might have gotten cut off, but some analysis uh, that we've done with some time studies is that, you know, 660 hours over the manual process back in the old days, and I've done old day calculations, by the way, um, with the analysis software, you're saving over 250 hours, right? There's such a time savings. You can do more with what you have. Uh, another perfect example of this, I worked on a 20 story high rise. It was a residential uh, high end condominium project. And, and I ran a detailed load calculation energy analysis at the very beginning of the design build. So during construction, the developer called up and says, hey, can I change the glazing? And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, he goes, I've got a better price or better delivery that helps the schedule. I'd like to use this different type of glazing. And so I made it sound like it was a very big deal, but in reality, it was less than an hour of my time because I had all of that information available in my energy model, not a uh, BIM or Revit model, but the information was there. If we all work in that same model and we have the information from the architect, from the structural, from the MEP team, all of that information is readily available and then we can all act upon it with all the information and not just partial. Again, part of the, uh, the advance that. Um, yeah, reduce wastage, right, uh, on job sites. I mean, especially the design changes. That, I think, is awesome, right? It's like we're all rushing uh, in the AE world. There's deadlines, right? We, we've got to get it out the door. We've got to meet this bid date. We've got to get in for the permit. they got to start moving dirt, right? They need so much time to bid it. Think of how much extra collaboration time could be spent up front on the design and coordination with the design team that it would make up for all of that um, the qualifying the bid, the bid times, you know, if you had that whole team put together, you could save what, two to four to six or eight weeks, you could save quite a bit of time. And instead of just sitting there waiting for the RFIs to come in, the questions during bidding, uh, the pre-bid, the bid qualifications, you spent that time collaborating on a much better building that's going to be built the way you designed it. Again, I think, uh, Steve, you mentioned something. Oops, did that backwards. Uh, you had mentioned something about the uh, architect or the engineers liking it, that, hey, there's less changes during construction because we've got it all figured out during the design phase. Um, you know, what is the shaft size? How much room do we need for clearance? How many access doors do I have to cut into that architect's beautiful gypsum board ceiling to get access to the equipment? Um, so that's the key is that it's building that virtual model before you know the first uh, piece of pipe or duct or steel is, is uh, installed out in the field. So these, like, not to be an inclusive list, but here is just some of the software, right? All these different design simulation softwares. Um, obviously, uh, you know, Navisworks, uh, Autodesk products are, are, are kind of leading the way with some of the um, architectural drafting and the engineering software. So many different add-ons for photometric calculations, estimating, uh, design analysis, energy modeling. Um, and then again, that's what I was talking about earlier with the integrated design optimization. Perfect example that Getting the load calculations, like I described on my old project, that it was a, a takeoff by hand, versus if we had the Revit model, which we do every day, engineers and architects are running multiple uh, energy analysis, right? What if I rotate the building? What if I change the R value of the roof? What if I do this? How do I do this with the glazing? Can I still meet the lead requirements? Can I still meet the energy code? It, it's, it's built in and it's live, real world calculations. So having that model, doing it together, uh, is, is just so efficient. Same thing with the actual design. Um, so typical design for a, an engineer in the old days would be design the ductwork, design the piping, size it, 
know that not every offset is shown. I have to add some safety factor. I have to make it a little bigger. I have to account for what's going to happen in the field. But in a collaborative, integrated design, it's real world, right? As soon as we change that and we have all of the offsets absolutely provided, we can size that fan or that pump for exactly what we need. So we're going to save energy, we're going to save materials, we're going to save money, we're going to save time. So we, we've taken out all those little safety factors that don't do anything but drive up project costs. Same thing with the pump. It's the exact same process, right? When I change or add a fan coil, uh, move the chiller, add another floor, it's real world calculations. We've got the head pressure, friction losses of the pump systems. It's a much more efficient and analytical tool at the engineer's disposal that they didn't have 10 or 15 years ago. This I think is just the same thing. It's just another example of um, of how we're doing that on the plumbing side, right? Domestic booster pumps. Um, again, it's so easy to just size it based on the building, based on the pressure requirements, and then go through, put a safety factor on, pick the next biggest size equipment. But are you really doing the building, the project, and the client a service versus a real world calculation with what you actually are gonna have? Uh, duct size, we, we kind of talked about that, but it's the same process, right? As far as the load calculation goes, and then the actual uh, optimization of the duct, similar to what we talked about with the, uh, the lighting system. Again, so many, you know, McQuay is just uh, one of the example softwares that's an add-on that's used by many engineers. Uh, sizing, right? Um, again, it's, it's too easy for engineers to oversize, put safety factor on and say, hey, Let's make sure we don't have any trouble. It's easier to just do it this way. That's the way we've always done it. Again, we have the opportunity with the software at our disposal to right size it, to make it right. Let us not put in more systems, spend more money, waste more natural resources than necessary. The uh, voltage drop calculations, you know, how, how far is that uh, cable running? You know, am I going up 20 floors? Am I going up two floors? You know, uh, a lot of engineers, they might just uh, use the, the worst case scenario and say, well, hey, what if they do it this way? You know, but again, that's copper. That's natural resources that we don't need to spend. And it just gets wasted over the life of the building. You know, let's do it and do it right. Energy analysis, I talked about that just a little bit, and this was back to when do you engage the design team, right? The time to get the mechanical engineer for the energy model is, is early, early, early on with the architect, right? The, the uh, mechanical engineer understands the ASHRAE, the International Energy Code. They understand how to get those models so that you can complete. And if you want that all glass occupancy, that all glass south facing window, right? It's not an easy thing to achieve, but with the help of a collaborative team, you can do it. This was back to the uh, uh, photometrics, right? So, so again, good question here. What if the architect says, hey, I wonder what if we do this or what if I do that? In the design phase, early on, the architect and engineer, they pick their team, right? So as an engineering firm, if your client calls you up, how many times do you want to rerun that, that photometric calculation, right? You did it once, you, you finished it, you set it off, you said, here's the base of design. Um, so it just gets complicated that it doesn't have to be, right? If working together, you have that information in the model, and you're all part of the ultimate, let's do what's best for the client and let's do it now so that we don't have to rethink this during construction. It, it works best as a collaborative team instead of in those silos. Just another example, uh, again, from a sketch to the complete layout, uh, renderings. Um, this is the collaborative software that you know architects can, can modify, change, see what they're doing um, and see how it impacts it. And then this is, uh, let's see if it changes, the, um, the lighting simulation, right? Uh, photometrics for site lighting, uh, so many different tools out there, so many different rendering tools. Some of these renderings are, you know, what I'll call video game uh, quality. They're just crazy, crazy impressive. 
Uh, distribution board, uh, again, the efficient layout and location and sizing of our cables and connectors. Um, it, it helps with the efficiency of the electrical system. Uh, it also allows us to uh, integrate that with the building for uh, both efficiency and out of sight, out of mind, right? Uh, you don't want this to be in a prominent location. Like I said, with the access doors, right? We need service and access. So the integrated design allows us to build that in so that we know and we can communicate early to the design team some of the challenges of what we need and how we need to access it. And then ultimately, how do you replace the equipment, right? We know equipment fails. It needs to be serviced, maintained, and replaced. So let's make sure we build that in to the, uh, to the design process. And what better way, just do it at the very, very beginning as a team. So the outcomes, again, we talked about multiple ways that we can use the software to improve and optimize both systems. And then again, saving time, schedule, materials, and energy, because everything we do to increase the efficiency is a win-win for the uh, lifetime of that facility. Um, again, like I said earlier, circles, lines, uh, squares, and text. It's not just that. It's so easy. Uh, an example I like to give is back in the day, I could take a single line drawing and I, with that one single line and in a note, I could say this is a three quarter inch PVC condensate drain from a fan coil. But if I erase that note, I could easily call that a four inch welded black iron steam, high pressure steam line, right? But in the model, huge difference, right? Huge difference. Uh, the hangers, the support, the weight, the insulation, the, the volumetric space required for that pipe. Um, so I think that's kind of the mindset for the engineering team to say, look, we need to know what that material is when we're designing it and not just say, hey, you can do this or you can do that. Go look at the spec. I think we need to get the engineers to say, pick the system and stick with it and let's put it in the model the way it'll actually be built. Same thing. Uh, let's see. Changes, yeah, electrical. The, the same process, right? Let's let's show our cables. Let's show our bus duct. Let's show the connectors. More importantly, I think the the integrated um, model, uh, the MEP model. The best thing it does is with the electrical, is create those no fly zones, right? For the National Electric Code for life safety, right? Let's not run pipes over panels or over equipment or over switchgear. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that in the field. And either they were forced into it, they didn't get an inspection. It's just wrong. It's a very serious um, life safety issue. So well, let's not do that. Let's, let's integrate it early so we know what we're doing. We know who's going where and we got the rules. Uh, plumbing, same systems. And if you look at it too, everything, mechanical, electrical and plumbing actually works out as we integrate it into the early design model to become prefabricated, right? Prefabrication, the mechanical and plumbing contractors, especially the sprinkler guys, they've been doing this for decades, right? So the more we can build offsite, pressure test it, test it, bring it on site and install it, it's a win-win, it saves schedule. Back to that schedule saving and reduce risk. Same thing with fire protection. Like I said, the, the wet pipe guys, they've been cutting pipe, bringing it out like an erector set and installing it for decades. So all of these players, the fire alarm, fire protection, mechanical, plumbing, electrical, data systems, security systems, access control, everybody, the earlier we get them involved in the design process, the better the, better the design, the better the process, and then you have more experts at the table uh, at the beginning instead of out in the field saying, hey, I barely remember this job. How do we solve that problem now? So, so that, my friends is pretty much what I have and we have some time now for some questions and answers and I don't know I think uh, uh, Bimal is you, are you gonna take this over yes uh, many thanks Chip and Steve uh, for the excellent presentation and a very detailed one uh, with a lot of data from the industry and from your daily life now, you have made such a compelling presentation for the use of integrated design and construction. But why the adoption is so low? 
what are we waiting for chip i mean what do you see in the industry like steve said that 14 years back when he started doing the research he could count the number of people using 3d model and i think today we are probably in a stage where we can count the number of people uh, who are using integrated design so how much time it is going to take and what is stopping us from adopting it the question is for both of you i from from my perspective um I, I, I'm not really sure. I wish I had the answer. If I had the answer, I, I'd go out and, and spread the word. Um, it's a combination. I think Steve Slide said some architects are mandating, right? Some general contractors are saying, look, you must work in BIM. You must work in 3D. And I think that's excellent because it's really dragging um, engineers and dragging consultants into the 3D world. I think a lot of it, honestly, is just that's the way we've always done it. I think it's just the mindset of this has worked for 30 years. This has worked for 50 years. Why do I need to change? You know, um, I think engineers are sometimes hesitant, right? And they also like to keep things close to the chest, right? To say, I, I want to, I want to know how that works. You know, when I do the load calculation, I know it's my information. I'm not counting on the information from that BIM model. So I think it's a combination, but I agree with you that we need to get more of the young engineers and designers um, to understand the real systems that they're designing so that the models are more accurate and it can be used for construction and not just design. Yeah, like I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that, Chip. Um, I would say that at this point, the tools are way, way, way ahead of the implementation. I would say our challenge is probably 10% technology, 90% sociology. And to Chip's point of this is the way we always did it, a lot of people that I have talked with over the years who haven't gotten in the pool yet or who are still very much in the shallow end, they see it as an increase in their risk because it's unfamiliar. They also see it as potentially uh, the transparency that's involved is, is also potentially risky in and of itself uh, because everybody likes to think that their company has a secret sauce for doing what they do and they don't necessarily like to share that. They like to keep that within their own silo. And so I think again to Chip's point, the younger folks coming in, these are people who've grown up working with uh, 3D video games. They're gonna love this stuff. They're gonna get it immediately. And some of this will just purely be generational and we'll get to the point where nobody will believe you when you try to explain to them how it used to be. They would say nothing could have gotten built. <laughs> how, how could you have done that? You know, I don't believe you. Uh, it'll be that obvious to everybody. and It'll just be that natural. I agree. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, and I can see one of the question from the audience, uh, which really uh, tells us why, uh, you know, that option is so low. The question is, is BIM software progressed to the point where the software can provide reliable calculations? So people still are not convinced that uh, these softwares can do reliable calculations. So what has been your experience, uh, Steve and Chip? Well, well, I'll respond to that first. Chip, you've, you've had a lot more hands-on experience, but I will just say from the 30,000 foot level, um, it's like any database that you would go to. If the, if the information was input correctly at first, the information will be correct when it's there. If it was not built well, then it will not be correct. And I do think that there's a problem out there that we have, that we, a lot of people don't like to talk about. I call it the elephant in the room or, or you know, the, the uh, you only see 10% of the tip of the iceberg and that's poor model quality. Like awful lot of people got the software, never really got trained that well in it, are kind of feeling their way through it, and they're making a lot of bad quality models with bad quality information in them. It's one of the reasons that a company like Pinnacle is important, because if you trust Pinnacle to do your work, you know it's going to be done correctly the first time. But there's so the, 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 the growth of the BIM software has been so fast relatively and so widespread that there's a lot of people making really poor quality models unfortunately so I would say it's not the BIM software it's the quality of the modeling 
that went into that software, which is creating the uncertainty and the potentially unreliable results. If the model is built well, the results will be absolutely perfect. And, and, Chip, and, you can share what you know. Yeah, Steve, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, the, the saying garbage in, garbage out, right? Is that yeah, if yeah, there is a poor, poor quality model, then the results are poor. But I, I think the, the question about, you know, has the software progressed to the point where it's reliable? Um, the answer is yes. Um, I think it's back to the confidence of the user, right? I mean, um, think about the first guy that jumped out of an airplane with a parachute, you know, is this thing going to work? You know, he's got to trust that it will. And he did hopefully some uh, pre-flight checks <clears throat> to make sure that it was efficient, effective, and it was going to perform as intended. So. I, I, I do think that engineers, at least the older generation, not the newer ones, like you said, the ones that were raised or are raised with the video technology that they, they've been exposed to their whole life, I think they're more accepting of it. Um, whereas I think the older generation are like, wait a minute, I can't see it. If I can't see it and touch it, how do I know that this is right? Because this is an important thing and I want everybody to, to remember this. An engineer's number one goal, right, is not to be sued, right? They don't want to ever be named in a lawsuit so that they can say, you screwed something up, right? So in order for them to minimize that risk, they're going to keep it close to the chest, right? To say this third-party software, eh, you know, if I do it my way, I know it's going to work, right? So I think it's a hesitancy to either learn or to trust. Maybe it's a trust issue. I'm not sure. But the answer is yes, the software is there. And I've used several of these softwares and I've tested them, right? Because again, as an engineer, I want to make sure it's accurate before I put my name and my stamp on it. So the software is there, but like, like you said, Steve, poor quality models are prevalent in the industry and we need to do better uh, to get those improved. Thanks, uh, thanks Chip and uh, Steve. In fact, there is one more question again on the skepticism and uh, I, I would like to share one of my experiences uh, in the industry. Uh, we, we, we were working on a big project and uh, we built up the nice model and we calculated the concrete quantities of different grade. And we also had the, the client side, they had their own quantity surveyors with 35 years of experience and they would not accept our quantities, you know. And we had a difference of uh, almost 4% uh, in the quantities. And we took up that challenge and ultimately, you know who won the, the, <laughs> the bet. So, yes, in the beginning, we always uh, mistrust, you know, there is a mistrust in the technology. And in fact, this is the next question. How does we ensure that the integrated process will be more efficient? Data depicts always great and theoretically it's next level of paradigm. Will it really work in practical world? <laughs> Very interesting. So before I put it to the panelists, uh, again, I'd like to uh, inform you all, as Steve and Chip has been saying, uh, friends, this paradigm shift has already taken place. Uh, Chip demonstrated, he showed all the the, all these slides were from practical examples that we have done on multiple hundreds and hundreds of projects. We have seen how the integrated process, you know, you move that time to pre-construction. You know, if you have 18 months for a project, then it's better to spend that extra 15 days in the pre-construction, you want to save three months in the construction time. And yes, all the calculations work as as they said if the if the things are modeled well in fact there is one question in fact i must say that this uh, presentation has been hugely successful because i've got now almost 30 40 questions uh, that have been coming and a lot of people are asking about the success stories whether this works you know that there's all kind of skepticism i can see in the questions so we'll be very happy to share with more case studies. Do write to us. We would be very happy to share what are the different softwares, what they, what they can do, how you can plan your integrated uh, design and management. And uh, you know, we'll be very happy to support you because we, as uh, Chip said, that it's our passion. You know, we, we want this technology to spread. We want 
our construction cost to reduce we want our construction projects to be speeded up to be completed ahead of time so we have now limited time so i would like uh, steve and chip uh, to share their thoughts and reassure the audience that where the technology stands can we trust it and also who is going to force it is it going to be the owners is it going to be the architects is it going to be the engineers or is it going to be the contractors who is going to force the implementation speed of this integrated design over to both of you yeah i'll, I'll respond uh, i i always like to talk about what i know rather than what i think and that's why we do the research and so the data that's in the report please you'll see the link to to the report there um please download it uh this is why we do this is we go out and talk to the people who know what they're talking about because they're doing it and we get very specific feedback on exactly what kinds of benefits they're getting from doing exactly what sorts of tasks um uh, and that will will should set your expectations about what you can expect to gain by doing this right um and we're going to continue to do that. So, I think there's proof out there, a quantitative proof that this is working today. And so you can have confidence in moving forward. Chip. Yeah, I I agree. Um we're seeing it more and more and I think it's the education of what is actually happening and who's doing it. Um who's going to force it? I think that's an excellent question. From my perspective, with the majority of my career as a consulting engineer the client is forcing it right so whether and I, and I don't know that most owners right the owners in my opinion look at it as hey steve when you were an architect right steve's architecture firm is going to design this building for me and it's going to be awesome how steve does that is steve's expertise right whether he wants to use ink pen AutoCAD, Revit, it doesn't matter as long as I get my beautiful building, right? So the means and method is kind of back to Steve as the architect. So as a consulting engineer, if Steve's firm came to me to say, "I want you to design the MEP systems and you will use Revit." Guess what? I'm going to use Revit <laughs> because I want to do that job and I want to work with Steve. So I think when the clients drive that or some of the advanced general contractors across the country and across the world say you will do virtual design. You know, we got a VDC manager. Here's our BIM execution standards. You will do this. That's when they jump on board. It separates the the light commercial residential guys from the serious guys. And you got to have the wherewithal, the resources and, and the experience and the learning curve. It's an investment. So I think who's driving that is going to be the client and if it's the engineer his client is the architect the architect their client is the developer or the owner I I think that's who's going to drive it And for the trades their client is the GC Right and that's why we studied in that report how many people are mandating how many people are only encouraging and how many people haven't done anything yet and again we really want to see those numbers grow with the mandates and the standards and the the, the standardized processes and practices all of that's very good stuff. Right. And I think the contractors are reaping the contractors I believe my my opinion is that they're reaping the the first benefits the first fruits of that labor with the prefabrication right let me go build all yes. of this nickel gas pipe in my shop and come out and hang it on site i've got less people on site i've got less waste on site less risk less hazard uh the weather's perfect in my shop <laughs> it's rainy or cold or snowy on my job site so they're the ones that i think are seeing the immediate return on the investment is an engineering firm I don't really see the return on the investment for going to BIM and Revit in 3D, right? I still put out a 2D document, so it takes me longer. So it actually costs me more. Um so I think the I I think the driving force is the client, but the the, the industry is headed there, it's already there, and, and I think it's just more to go. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Steve. Um, I must confess that if I can believe anybody in the construction industry, it is Steve Jones. Uh, he has done so much research in every part of the world, and the kind of reports he has published 
uh, you know it is it is phenomenal and today when he says that he's seeing it happening and we see it happening i'm sure that uh, you know we will be adopting technology of course our industry has been very slow in adopting technology but now these are the most exciting times and trust me the kind of paradigm shift that is happening the revolution that we are going through it is it is unbelievable it's a, it's a storm that is coming and we all need to get ready for it we all need to prepare for it uh, if we want to stand out and that's what the theme of our webinars are that if you don't adopt it you'll be wiped out so friends many thanks for your patient hearing and raising these questions i know we could not uh, answer all the questions due to the time shortage but we will be responding to all your questions individually and if you have any further questions please don't hesitate to ask us and ask our panel uh, steve or uh, chip uh, we'll be very happy to respond and guide you on whatever you want once again thanks steve thanks chip for the excellent presentation i think it was really thought provoking and it will benefit our industry have a great time stay safe friends